Hello everyone, I'm Happy Caldwell and welcome to Arkansas Live. All this week we've been talking about investing for the future, but today we're going to deal with how to be delivered and how to walk and get victory over poverty. Stay tuned, I'll be right back. Stay tuned for today's program and if you've got your Bible and pencil and paper ready to take notes, then do so because you can't remember everything that you hear. Now, you can go online, vtntv.com, and pull up On Demand. You can watch every episode of Arkansas Live that where I'm, I'm dealing with this. Uh, but it's all, always good to uh, hear it. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. It's always good to take notes so you can go back and read it again, hear it again for yourself. Um, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Now, uh, today we're going to basically look at um, how to walk in deliverance from poverty. Poverty is a spirit. Once you get delivered from it, I had to be delivered from it. You get, you get delivered from the mindset of poverty. Then how how do you walk in it? How do you continue to walk in the victory over that poverty mindset? Because it tries to, it'll try to come back, and you'll <laughs> you'll find yourself. Now I'm going to say some things that I'm not trying to anger you or insult you, but I'm going to say some things that I had to learn to go through, and and you might have to do the same thing. But when the spirit of poverty mindset tries to come back on you, you'll find yourself drifting back into your old habits. And I had to force myself, and my wife helped me. I had to force myself to do what I'm, I'm teaching you now. You have to force yourself. By that, I'm talking about you have to let your spirit man gain ascendancy over your flesh and over your carnal thinking, your carnal way of thinking, your carnal mind. If you begin to think those thoughts of poverty or less, you have to rebuke them in the name of Jesus. And you say, I, I, I will not go back there. I will not uh, allow that thought to come back into my mind. I'm not going backwards. And you have to watch it that you're not tempted uh, I think I can say this um, without you being offended, but uh, I'll use my mother-in-law, for example. My mother-in-law's in heaven. <laughs> Hope, hopefully she's not watching today, but if she was alive, she'd, she'd get on to me. She'd correct me. She, she treated me like I was her son. Uh, my mother died, oh my goodness, in 1968. And so my mother-in-law, Jeannie's mother, it just kind of adopted me and she said, okay, I'm going to be your new mother and you're going to be my son. She, she would correct me. She would straighten me out. Well, she's been in heaven for quite a few years now herself. But before she went to heaven, now she was a, a single mom. She worked at the state revenue department. Uh, she lived on what was called a fixed income, a little income, and then social security. But she had also paid into an insurance plan, a burial plan, all that. So when she died, she, she, her family didn't have to pay for anything. She had made provisions for her and so forth. But there was always one thing that really bothered me. And it was a temptation. It, wasn't, it was her business. It wasn't any of my business. But she had what was called back then a measured phone line. And she, it, because it was relatively cheap, inexpensive, and I had helped her uh, when her uh, when she retired. I had helped her. I helped her. She sold her home, and she sold her car, and she bought um, a mobile home and a new car, and that lasted her for until she died. It was very frugal, but she lived on a fixed income, meager income. But she always had a measured phone line, uh, which means uh, she only had to pay for the time or the calls that she made. And the fewer calls that she made, uh, the, her phone bill was less. 
I think I'm getting this right. I don't know. It's been so many years ago. I don't remember all the <clears throat> different plans that they had at that time. But the, what, what she did was she worked out a system with her daughters that if she wanted to talk to them any length of time, she would call them and let the phone ring two times. And that was her signal that she was calling and she wanted you to call her back. So she didn't have to pay for making the call. In other words, it was, it was a measured phone line. So she had to pay for the, for the length of time or the amount of time that she talked on the phone. So that was her way of minimizing her expense on her telephone. This was before mobile phones. This was before any of the Internet stuff and social media platforms. So she worked it out with all of her daughters that she would call. And, and if your phone rang two times, you knew it was her. And so you'd call her back. And we didn't have measured phone lines, so we, didn't, we just paid a monthly fee. So it didn't cost us anything extra if, if she and Jeannie wanted to talk an hour. You know, that was fine. And, and that always bothered me because um, I, I just I just sensed in here, and and I and I think I told her one time. <laughs> I said, you know, um, why do you do that? She said, well, t it it saves me money. Now this is again, this is not a criticism or a judgment, and don't mean to be offensive, but there are little things that can draw you back into a mindset. Before you know it, you're clipping coupons. And there's nothing wrong with coupons or sales or whatever. Uh, but before you know it, you've drifted back over into that poverty mindset. Oh, I can't afford that. I can't do that. I can't do that. Now, my mother-in-law was a giver. She was a tither. And I believe that's why God blessed her. And you say, well, I'm, I'm being a good steward. I'm being frugal. But there's, there's a trap there. That's all I'm trying to say. There's a trap. It'll get you back into a poverty mindset of thinking less and least and poor and whatever. And for years, I had to, you know, this is just me, I had to refuse. I refused to go to sales and buy things on sale. I refused to go to certain stores that were known as discount stores. Uh, I refuse to go there because it's, it's not that I think it's wrong. I mean, it doesn't really matter what I think, but I didn't, I didn't go there because I did not want to get back to that poverty way of thinking. I went and I went to stores that charged regular going price. I went to restaurants and ate food that, uh, you know, was probably more expensive than the local junk food restaurant or whatever. I learned what God was trying to teach me of eating down the left side of the menu instead of the right side of the menu. I had to watch myself. I didn't buy the least. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't frivolous. I didn't throw money away, as they say. But I was learning something. You follow me? I can't, I can't stay at the level that God needs me to stay at if I'm going to go back to this poverty way of thinking. Now, I hope I'm not offending anybody. I'm just telling you how it was with me. Where God wanted to get me was so I could do what I'm doing now, ministering to you, <laughs> building TV stations, keeping them operate. Believe him for the money that we need to pay the electric bill, to uh, replace transmitters, to put up new towers, to all the things that are required in uh, television to hire uh, qualified people to do all the things that we need to buy the equipment. And I could not let myself go back to that poverty mindset of thinking least, less, <laughs> least, less. So I, I conditioned myself. I'm, I'm not going to go to that big box store and buy the the cheapest thing or whatever. It doesn't mean that I won't and that I haven't, but I wasn't going to allow myself to go back into that poverty mindset. 
I, I couldn't afford to do that. Are you following what I'm saying? I couldn't afford to go back to the poverty mindset and still do what God has called me to do. I, I, I couldn't go back to clipping coupons and uh, basing everything I do on sales. I don't, I don't go a, a, into a store or travel or a hotel or whatever. I don't go and ask for a discount. I, I'm not, I don't, I'll, I'm blessed when people want to bless me with something or, uh, but I'm not going to go pursuing the discount route. Are you following me? <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I apologize to you now if I'm offending you, but I, I could not go back to that poverty way of thinking, that mindset uh, of the discount and the coupons or else I couldn't do what God's called me to do. And he told me, he said, if you don't build this building, if you don't build this television network, I'll get somebody else. And I asked him when he called me to do what we're doing now, I asked him, I said, uh, have you called anybody else to do this? This was back in the early 80s. Have you called anybody else to do this? He said, yes. I called, <laughs> now listen to this. This will humble you real quick. He said, I called six other ministers to do what you're doing. Whoa. Uh, he said, you, and he said this to me. He said, you were not my first choice. <laughs> That'll humble you. I said, well, how many did you call? Six other people. He said, you mean I'm number seven? He said, you're number seven. And if you don't do it, I'll get somebody else. There'll be a number, a number eight. So I realized it wasn't about me. It was about what God wanted done. It's what he wanted to do for the people of Arkansas, Mississippi, Tennessee, Missouri, all over the world now through Roku and live stream. It's what he wanted to do through the teaching programs that we have on VTN. In fact, the call letters, he gave me the call letters. I remember it so well. I was sitting on the, on the edge of my bed in our bedroom and I was praying and asking the Lord because we had to have call signals. We had to have call letters. And in our area of television, everything starts with a K. And so I had to add to that K because our network was going to be listed as K something. And they had a list of, of all the letters that you could put together. And my eyes focused on the Victory Television Network. That's what we started with. We started in 1988, KVTN, the Victory Television Network. And so that's what we called it because we wanted to teach victory. We wanted people to know. We copyrighted the name. Others have tried to use it, but it belongs to VTN. It's copyrighted. And we wanted to teach people the victory. We wanted to teach them how to get the victory, how to stay in victory, how to walk in victory. So we built the Victory Television Network. Now, how do you walk in this deliverance from poverty? Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now, a stronghold is, is a thought that has embedded itself in your mind. It's, it, it can be true or not true. If you have a stronghold of truth, by his stripes I was healed. Isaiah 53, 1 Peter 2, 24. If that's the stronghold, boy, that's there. You got it. Nothing can prevent you from walking in divine healing because that's a stronghold. It's in your mind. You're not going to accept any lie. You're not going to accept anything to the, to the opposite of that. You're not going to accept any, you're not going to accept any diagnosis, even though it might be real medically, but you're not going to accept it physically, spiritually, mentally, because you have a stronghold built up in you. No weapon formed against me will prosper. No evil shall befall me. No plague come near me. So you have a stronghold, a positive biblical stronghold. But what if your stronghold 
is a negative poverty stronghold? Uh, what if this thing has, has become uh, tantamount? Uh, a stronghold is a wrong thought entered into the mind and it becomes a stronghold in the negative. You can have a positive thought. It becomes a stronghold. You can have a negative thought. Poverty is a negative thought. It is a wrong thought admitted to the mind. And it becomes a stronghold. Another example, I was walking down the hall of a nursing home, assisted living with my grandmother. Uh, she had had to put my grandfather in there just simply because she couldn't take care of him. It was nothing major wrong with him. He was just old. He was 90 years old. She was 93. And I'm walking down this, the hall with her, and I could tell she was upset. I, I could tell it, it hurt her to have to put him. They'd been married at that time 65, 70 years. <laughs> and she was having to put him in a... She could go over and visit him, spend the day with him, but then she went home at night because she couldn't dress him. She couldn't get him up and out of the bed, so she had to have help. So she placed him in this nursing home around the corner from where she lived. And I'd go up and visit with him and her. And so she and I were walking down the hall and she looked up at me and she said, grandson, the Bible tells us that God won't put any more on us than we can bear. And this is more than I can bear. Oh man, I tell you, I just wanted to hug her. I did hug her and, and, and let her know the truth. I said, grandmother, God has not allowed any of this to come on you. God didn't put any of this on grandfather. He didn't put any of this on you. Well, she just looked up at me because in our family, you didn't correct your elders. She just looked up at me and she didn't have any clue as to what I was saying. The scripture says, God will not allow you to be tempted above that that you're able but along with the temptation, he'll make the way for you to escape it. That's what the Bible says. But what she quoted to me was what she had heard for 70 years in her church. God won't put any more on you than you can bear. That's not in the Bible. That's not biblical. You might be thinking that. That is a stronghold that is formed in your mind from a wrong thought, a wrong doctrine, a wrong way of thinking. God is not putting sickness on you. God's not putting poverty on you. God's not putting guilt and shame on you. He's not putting anything on you to steal, kill, and destroy. That's the Bible says steal, kill, and destroy is from the enemy. The enemy came to steal, kill, and destroy. But God came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And then you add to that the, the, the erroneous doctrine that God is putting these things on you to teach you a lesson. That's not how God teaches you. The Bible says the Holy Spirit is the teacher. In 1 John 2, 20 and 27, it says the unction, the Holy Spirit, is to show you, to teach you all things. Jesus told his disciples in John 14 and John 16 that the Holy Spirit will reveal all truth to you. He'll bring all things to your remembrance, whatever I've said to you. Now, if you're not saved, if you're a heathen, a sinner, or whatever, if you are in rebellion, then you're going to have to deal with these things all your life. Disobedience and whatever causes these things to come, but you can't throw it off on God. God is not doing these things to you to teach you a lesson. But yet that's what she'd heard for 70 years. And so she said, God... Won't, uh, 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 she said, God, uh, the Bible said, God won't put any more on you than you can bear. I said, Grandma, the Lord didn't say that. The Bible doesn't say that. It says, God will not allow you to be tempted above that that you're able to deal with, but it'll make the way for you to escape it. That's the scripture. And he said here, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Notice the language, pulling down the stronghold. Now, he, he said in the previous verse, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. So you don't do this in the natural. You don't do this through mental gymnastics. You don't do this through the power of positive thinking. That's, that's not what this is about. This is not metaphysics. This is not about 
um, mental gymnastics. This is a spiritual law. This is spiritual power. Paul told the Corinthians at one place, he said, I can't speak to you about spiritual things because you're carnal. So you can't be carnal. He said, our weapons are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now, if a stronghold is a wrong thought that's entered into the mind and you find out from the scriptures or from teaching or by revelation if you find out that the stronghold that's in your mind, this wrong thought, this wrong way of thinking, then how are you going to get it out? Now, if you've been delivered, if you had somebody lay hands on you or speak to you and command that spirit to leave you and loose you, but it tries to come back, what do you do when you start thinking those old thoughts? What do you do when that poverty mindset tries to come back? What do you do when you find yourself drifting back into the old ways, buying the cheapest, the least, going to the stores that are coupons and discounts? I'm talking about a way of life here. I'm not talking about not enjoying free gifts or bonuses or that kind. I'm talking about a way of life where you live in that poverty level all the time. And, and if you don't get a discount or a coupon or something free, uh, that, that's, I'm talking about going back into that old lifestyle. When you sense that's beginning to happen, then you need to deal with it immediately. You need to say, uh-uh, I'm not going back there. No, sir. I cast that imagination, that thought down. How do you do that? That's what it says. It says, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Casting down imaginations or thoughts and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. So what is a thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God? The knowledge of God is what the word of God teaches you. Let's just take healing, for example. We're talking about poverty, but let's just take healing. Jesus died on the cross, bore your sickness, your disease, your sin, and by his stripes you were healed, 1 Peter 2.24. Isaiah 53 said you are healed, 1 Peter 2.24 says you were healed. So you're healed through Jesus' sacrifice on Calvary. So a stronghold that would exalt itself against the knowledge of God would say to you, oh, you're not healed. You got pain. You got fever. You got sickness. Your nose is running. <laughs> you, got, you got symptoms. You're not healed. That's exalting. That's a thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Because you know, regardless of the circumstances, regardless of the temperature and the fever and the, all of, you're healed by the stripes of Jesus. The knowledge of the word of God is you were healed 2,000 years ago when Jesus died on the cross. Your healing was obtained. He became your sin substitute. The Bible says he became sick so you could become well. He became poor so you could be prosperous. He became sin so you could become righteous. So when that old thought comes back and tries to get you to go back into that poverty, think, I, oh, we can't afford that. We can't afford that. We can't do this. We can't go there. We can't. You have to cast that thing down. You have to talk to it. You have to say, you spirit of poverty and lack, you get out of my mind. You get out of my life. God's my source. I have given and it's given unto me. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give unto my bosom. I'm blessed to be a blessing. Whatever I do prospers. You have to replace that old way of thinking with the new way of thinking. You have to cast down that old thought that is trying to exalt itself above the knowledge of God that you have. And that is how you walk in your deliverance. You have to bring into captivity every thought. That's the next part of it. Verse 5, casting down imaginations, everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought under the obedience of Christ. You cast down one thought and you bring into captivity another thought. And it's a, it's a good use of words when it says you bring into captivity. So what you're doing, you're taking 
the word of God to you, you're taking it captive and you're going to hold on to it. You're not going to let it go. You're captivating that word. When you're in church or in a gospel meeting or on VTM and you hear somebody say something that just, oh, it just exhilarates you. It just refreshes you. It just, it goes into your spirit. And you, hallelujah, glory to God. I never saw that before. I got a revelation of that now. When you get that, you bring that into captivity. You hold on to it. You build a fence around it. You shut the door. <laughs> you captivate it. You don't let it go. You don't let Satan run in there and say, well, but now that's not for you. That's somebody else. You're of this poverty. You're of this mindset. Uh, you know, your daddy never had anything. You'll never have anything. Your mama did that. Listen, my mother, bless her heart, when, when daddy began to prosper, he wanted to buy her. Now, now listen to this. He wanted to buy her a dishwasher. He wanted to buy her a new refrigerator because we had an icebox. He wanted to buy her a color TV set and she wouldn't have any of it. She did not want it. <laughs> she was bound by that spirit of poverty. Black and white TV, okay, but not color. I don't need a dishwasher. I can wash them in the sink. When those things start coming back to you, you've got to cast them down. Now, there's nothing wrong with washing your own dishes. I did it for years. My sister and I would share one and wash and one to dry. You know how that is. And, and yet daddy wanted to bless her. He was prospering. He wanted to buy her a dishwasher. He wanted to get her a color TV. <laughs> oh man. When those thoughts start trying to come back to you and bring you back into your poverty way of thinking, then you've got to cast them down. You've got to say, no, nope, I'm not going back there. I'm not, I'm not going back into the old way of thinking. I'm not going back into that poverty and pinching every penny and doing without and hoarding up. Uh, most all of that's based on fear. And God's not giving you a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. Nothing wrong with saving. Nothing wrong with investing in the future. You know, you you get what you want, what you need, what God tells you to have. Well, we'll stop there for today, but we'll pick this up tomorrow. Join me for tomorrow's edition of Arkansas Live. And remember, Jesus is Lord of Arkansas and where you're watching too. Send your questions, comments, and testimonies to Happy Caldwell at Post Office Box 26207, Little Rock, Arkansas, 72221 or email happycaldwell at vtntv.com. Remember to follow VTN on Facebook at VTN Your Arkansas Christian Connection and follow Happy Caldwell on Twitter at happy underscore Caldwell. VTN is on Roku. Search VTN in the channel store and add us to your lineup. Today's episode is available to watch on demand at vtntv.com and click watch. You can also watch VTN via live stream at vtntv.com.